Liang Qichao, eighteen seventy three to nineteen twenty nine. Hao Rengong, intertwined the worlds of politics and literature for over thirty years. His high reputation was extolled throughout the country. Those who admired him came from all walks of life. They sought his writings and solicited his calligraphy. So how burdensome was such obligatory writings? It is difficult to conjecture. However, it must be plentiful enough to be unbearable. This is indeed the miserable drudgeries of celebrated literati throughout history. I recall the late years of my deceased friend, Mr. Wang Beiyue, who often complained about obligatory writings, which were tiring and draining for body and soul. Yet, this could hardly match the burden of Liang Qichao. As a consequence. Liang Qichao engaged the ghost writer. Liang Qichao asked his close friend, the Juren Provincial Graduate Tang Enpu, eighteen eighty one to nineteen sixty one, Hao Tianru, to be his ghost writer. Admittedly, they were both natives of Xinhui of Guangdong Province. Moreover, their scholarships. Were derived from the lineage of Zhu Ciqi, eighteen o seven to eighteen eighty one, Zi Zi Xiang, Hao Zi Gui, Zhou Jiang, native of Nanhai, Guangdong Province. Zhu attained the Jing Si degree, Metropolitan Graduate, in the twenty seventh year of the Dao Guang Reign, eighteen forty seven. He was magistrate of Xiangling in Shanxi Province for one hundred and ninety days. During this time, he greatly altered the customs of the county. Afterwards, he led a quiet life in Zhoujiang of Foshan, in Guangdong Province. He taught at the school of Li San Chao Tang for thirty years. Liang Qichao. Studied under Kang Youwei, eighteen fifty-eight to nineteen twenty-seven, Hao Nanhai, a distinguished student of Zhu Ciqi. Kang Youwei once wrote an introduction for the collected works of his teacher. A part of it reads: "For principle, Master Zhu respectfully practiced his beliefs. For ideal." He held no material desire. His moral rectitude towered to the blue sky. His learning explored extreme depths. He relinquished the scholarship of Han Dynasty. He forswore the scholarship of Song Dynasty. In order to reinstall the original teachings of Confucius. The purpose was to seek practical applications to save the people. The person who possessed ancient scholarship in our time was my teacher, Master Zhu Jiujiang. His teachings consisted of the four implementations and the five learnings. The first implementation is. Exercise filial piety with sincerity. The second implementation is venerate moral rectitude. The third implementation is refine individual disposition. The fourth implementation is scrutinize and sustain individual dignity. The first learning is the classics. The second learning is history. The third learning is anecdotes. The fourth learning is argumentation. 
The fifth learning is literature. Every day, whenever Master Zhu entered the classroom to teach, all the students waited there respectfully with solemn manners. Master Zhu was erudite with exceptional memory. He did not carry any book, yet he quoted from many works. He recited and crisscrossed the contents without missing a single word. When students transcripted these teachings, it became a book. The book Li San Jiang Yi, the lectures given at Li San, came into being in this manner. Yet it is only a fraction of his teachings. As for teaching the issues of righteousness, the concerns of moral rectitude, his spirit would be intense his cheeks reddened, his voice boomed and shook the walls, the listeners fearful. Although my ability is pitiful, when I first heard his elementary transmission of the great way, I decided it was possible to emulate the sage. I then abandoned all vulgar learnings. It was my beginning. This passage is ample illustration of Kong Yu Wei's heartfelt reverence towards his teacher. In the draft history of Qing, Zhu Qi is so described. At that time, everyone regarded him as the model teacher of humanity. The vitality of Confucianism in Guangdong province at the end of Qing dynasty still instills people of today with ceaseless nostalgia. The father of Tang Enpu, Tang Yuanjun, Zi, Cong Zi, attained his Juren degree in the second year of the Guangxu reign, 1876. He was a student of Zhu Qi. Here is a copy of the reprint of the examination papers of Tang En Pu. The first section includes information about his ancestors. Information about his father can be found here. The latter part is the examination papers of Tang En Pu. In the house of the Tang family, there were more than 10 manuscripts written by Tang Yuanjun in the classroom, all with commentaries handwritten by Zhu Qi, as well as impressions of a small seal with the characters Zhu Qi. This is one of the manuscripts with inscriptions by Zhu Qi above the writings of Tang Yuanjun. This is an inscription by Zhu Qi with his seal. This is another copy of the manuscripts. Inscription by Zhu Qi above the writings and an inscription with his seal. Here is another copy of one of the manuscripts. In Xinghai year 1911, Tang Enpu gifted one of his father's manuscripts with commentary by Zhu Qi to his fellow Juren examination candidate Huang Xiaojue. He made a copy to keep 
and inscribe these words on it. This is an inscription by Tang An Pu. The inscription reads, This piece of writing was composed by my father when he was a student of Master Zhu Ciqi. It was selected by Master Zhu as the best in his class. In July of Xinghai year, as I was chronicling the writings of my late father, my fellow Jiren examination candidate, Wang Xiaojue, was fervently seeking the ink works of Master Zhu so I gave him the original manuscript. I copied this piece of writing by my ancestor and respectfully stashed it in the house for my sons and nephews to read. They will know that our ancestor exerted himself in learning. Even a piece of writing intended for the imperial examination could realize such grand and lofty accomplishment attentively chronicled by Sun Enpu on 1st August in Xinghai year. In his early years, Tang Enpu also studied under Luo Xiling, another student of Zhu Ciqi. Liang Qichao attained the Juren degree in the 15th year of the Guangxu reign, 1889. Tang Enpu attained the Juren degree in the 29th year of the Guangxu reign, 1903. They were both successive provincial graduates with distinguished reputations who came from Xinghui. One may surmise that their friendship originated from Xinghui. Around the seventh year of the Republic, 1918, Liang Qichao wrote a letter from Tianjin to Tan Enpu in Peking. This is the first page of the letter. And here is the second page of the letter. The letter reads, Sir, I wish to ask a preposterous favor from you. Perhaps you are willing to grant it. It is the mother's birthday of Sun Yan Sen and he asked for a birthday essay. I cannot but oblige. Yet, I am really not adept at this kind of writing. Furthermore, there are already many articles I need to deliver promptly. My vigor and eyesight are inadequate for this. Therefore, I beg you to ghostwrite instead. Did you ever meet Yen Sen? He is the one of the first representatives elected to the National Assembly and is very loyal to the affairs of the party. He is composed, alert and competent. During the reign of Hongxian, 1916, he was a journalist from Si Si Xingbao newspaper stationed in Peking and was exceedingly well informed. Yuan Sikai, 1859 to 1916, searched everywhere for him, but could not find him. Yet he did not once leave Peking, even for a day throughout this time. From this, it is possible to picture his courage and wisdom. If you are kind enough to agree, I thank you together with Yen Sen. What about presenting you with his concise biography? I look forward to your reply, drafted by hand, respectfully presented to elder brother Enpu. 
Chi Chao, thirtieth. Yesterday I sent you a letter about the coughing of my second wife. I presume it has arrived. After taking your medicine, my wife's old illness is gone, but her right hand regularly feels numb. This has never occurred before. I do not know whether these are signs of ailment. I implore you to let me know as well. This letter is proof that Liang Qichao asked Tang Enpu to ghostwrite. Liang did not refrain from talking about this with his friends either. He wrote in the letter, "If you are kind enough to agree, I thank you together with Yan Sen." It was clear that Sun Yan Sen was fully aware that Liang Qichao had asked his friend Tang Enpu to ghostwrite the birthday essay. Lu Caiming from Foshan, Guangdong Province, wrote an introduction to the book Wen Zhang Xue: Studies of Writing by Tang Enpu. This is the book Wen Zhang Xue. This is the introduction by Lu Caiming. He also recounted the story of Liang Qichao and his ghostwriter. He wrote in the introduction. In the second year of the Republic, 1913, I met Liang Qichao in Peking at the house of Tan. We talked about Tan Zhongran, who specialized in hand studies in his native city. As well as Mr. Tang Enpu, hence I realized that the writings of Liang Qichao were often ghostwritten by Mr. Tang. After the fourth year of the Republic, 1915, Mr. Tang became the Secretary General of Wu Peifu. Those official announcements, letters, and telegrams he wrote affected and aroused the country. Mr. Tang was a literary giant of his generation. No wonder he was highly praised by my teacher, Master Qi. According to the introduction, quite a bit of writings by Liang Qichao was ghostwritten by Tang Enpu. Master Qi mentioned in the letter was Feng Xiyou, Zi Boqi, native of Foshan. He set up a school at Hesan, and Tang Enpu was a student of his. Both Feng and Tang attained the Juren degree in the same year, which was the twenty-ninth year of the Guangxu reign, nineteen o three. It was a much celebrated story at that time. Amongst the manuscripts left behind by Tang Enpu, there appeared. Eulogium of Cai Songbo at the state funeral, a piece ghost written by him at the request of Liang Qichao. This is the eulogium, and it reads: On twelfth April in the sixth year of the Republic, nineteen seventeen, my late friend. General Cai Songbo returned for burial in the open field of Yuelu Mountain of Changsha. I, Qi Chao, happens to be traveling in Peking, and am unable to attend the burial ceremony. I attentively composed the eulogium. The words are: "Alas, Songbo, I know not there can be joy in life." I know not there can be woe in death. Only when I heard your passing, my friend, tears flowed all over without restraint. Can it be that the Creator is heartless? Can it be 
that the cosmos is absurd. Our divine land has been simmering without notice the virtuous withered early. As the spirit banners flutter in procession, bear my sorrow on a piece of writing. I was told of the ceremony at the grave to head the path pulling the casket rope. Hindered by my stay in the capital of old, actuality and want are both at odds. Through the long nights wakened to brood, painful breaths and wounded liver. Alas, Song Bo, are you in the know or are you otherwise? The dead never rises, it is eternally so. For the dead to know, then try to sob no more. Alas, Song Bo, only the mountain of Lu, lofty and grand, only the river of Xiang, clear and calm, vital energy of the soul, here and there, homeward spirit to the tomb, safe and ever. Alas, I proffer these offerings for your enjoyment. Cai Songbo, 1882 to 1916, original name Gen Ying, Zi Songbo. His name later changed to Ne, native of Baoqing, Hunan province. In the 23rd year of the Guangxi reign, 1897, at the age of 16, he entered Si Wu Xue Tang School, which was founded in the same year in Changsha of Hunan province. Liang Qishao was appointed head teacher of Chinese at the school. He thought highly of Cai Songbo. The friendship between teacher and student started there. In the following year, Empress Dowager Cixi organized a coup d'etat. She executed the six gentlemen of the Hundred Days Reform and brought an end to the reform. Liang Qishao went into exile in Japan. Si Wu Xue Tang School was also banned. In the 25th year of the Guangxi reign, 1899, Liang Qishao assisted Cai Songbo to travel to Japan and enrolled in the Da Tong High School in Tokyo. In the following year, Cai Songbo returned to China and joined the Zi Li Army Rebellion organized by Tang Cai Chang, 1867 to 1900. The rebellion failed. He returned to Japan and changed his name to Cai Ne. The meaning of the character Ne is tip of a sword. He was ever more determined to assist the cause of revolution. In the 28th year of the Guangxi reign, 1902, Liang Qishao launched the Xinmin Chongbo newspaper in Yokohama. Cai Songbo was appointed editor. The year after, he graduated from the Imperial Japanese Army Academy. In the 30th year of the Guangxi reign, 1904, he returned to China. The year after, he was appointed chief training officer of the Guangdong New Reserve Army as well as Chief Staff Officer of the Governor's Office. In the 33rd year of the Guangxi reign, 1907, he was appointed Administrator of Guangxi Army Primary School. The later Bai Chongxi, 1893-1966, Li Pingxian, 1890-1987, and others were all alumni. In the following year, he was appointed commander of the 1st Biao of the New Reserve Army and was stationed in Nanning, Guangxi Province. In the first year of the Xuantong reign, 1909, he was appointed a superintendent of Guangxi, Jiang Wu Tang. The year after, he was appointed battalion commander of Guangxi Mixed Xie and ordered to be stationed in Yunnan Province. In the third year of the Xuantong reign, 1911, he was appointed assistant commander of the 37th Xie 
stationed in Kunming. In late Qing, there were approximately 16 zhen in the new army. Each zhen consisted of two xie. Each jing consisted of two zhen. Each xie was composed of over 4,000 officers and soldiers. In the same year, Tsai Songbo compiled quotes by Zhen and Hu on military affairs. Zhen is Zhen Guofan, 1811 to 1872, and Hu is Hu Lingyi, 1812 to 1861. On 10th October in the same year, news of the Wu Chang uprising arrived. Tsai Songbo plotted to reciprocate. Li Genyuan 1879 to 1965, led the students from Jiang Wutang to attack the northwest of Kunming City, Yunnan Province. Tsai Songbo led the attack of southeast. The city fell, and Yunnan declared independent. Tsai Songbo was elected military governor of the Great Han Military Government of Yunnan Province. When the Republic of China was founded in 1912, known as the first year of the Republic. Tremendous amount of work needed to be done. Tsai Songbo focused on the administration of Yunnan province. The year after, he was assigned to Peking. Tang Jiyao, 1883 to 1927, succeeded him as military governor of Yunnan province. In the same year, Tsai Songbo wrote Military Scheme and formed the Military Studies Society with Yan Shi San, 1883 to 1960, Jiang Fangzhen, 1882 to 1938, and nine others to unite like-minded people. In the third year of the Republic, 1914, he was awarded the title Zhao Wei General. In August the following year, Yuan Sikai formed the Chou An Society scheming to revive the political system of imperial China. Liang Qichao published the article, How Bizarre Is This Question of Political System? and became the first to publicly denounce the attempt to revive the imperial political system. Tsai Songbo then visited Liang Qichao in Tianjin to discuss possible actions. On 13th December, Yuan Sikai declared himself emperor. On 17th December, Tsai Songbo left Peking under disguise and arrived in Tianjin. He bid farewell to Liang and used an alias to board a ship to Japan. There he boarded another ship to Hong Kong. And on 22nd December, he arrived in the capital city of Yunnan province. He sent a telegram to Yuan Sikai and asked him to annul the imperial system. At the time, most of the supporters of Dr. Sun Yat-sen and the Kuomintang were in exile after the failure of the Second Revolution against Yuan in 1913. They were unable to do anything effective. On 25th December, Yunnan declared independence. The next day, the military headquarters of the army to protect the nation was formed. Tsai Songbo became commander-in-chief of the first army. Li Liejun, 1882 to 1946, became commander-in-chief of the second army, and Tang Jiyao became commander-in-chief of the third army. They then attacked Sichuan province. On 1st January, in the fifth year of the Republic, 1916, a proclamation of the 19 misdeeds of Yuan Sikai was announced. And on 5th January, telegrams were sent out across the country to form a crusade against Yuan and to safeguard the Republic of China. Liang Qichao was in Shanghai, instigating the revolt of the southwest provinces. On 15th March, Guangxi province declared independence. On 22nd March, Yuan called off the imperial system and dropped the reign year of Hongxian. On 24th March, Yuan asked Kang Youwei, Wu Tingfang, 
and Tang Songyi to help negotiate an end to the civil war. Tsai Songbo advocated the resignation of Yuan Sikai. On 3rd April, Guangdong province declared independence. On 11th April, Zhejiang province declared independence. On 26th April, Lingling district of Hunan province declared independence. In May, Heilongjiang, Shanxi province, Hunan province declared independence. On 6th June, Yuan Sikai died of illness. The Vice President Li Yuanhong, 1864 to 1928, succeeded him. The campaign against Yuan Sikai finally came to an end. Tsai Songbo was preoccupied in the battlefield and did not have time to attend his illness. When victory arrived, his throat illness, or some claimed it to be tuberculosis, was no longer healable. He arrived at the Kyushu Imperial University Hospital in Fukuoka in September of the fifth year of the Republic, 1916, and passed away on 8th November, aged 35. On 12 April in the sixth year of the Republic, 1917, a state funeral was held behind Wan Shou Temple on Yueru Mountain, Changsha City. Afterwards, the central government promulgated that the date, 25th December, in the fourth year of the Republic, 1915, when Yunnan province declared independence during the campaign against Yuan, be designated as Remembrance Day of Yunnan's revolt to protect the Republic. Tsai Songbo studied under Liang Qichao, while Liang Qichao fostered Tsai Songbo. After the death of Tsai Songbo on 5th December in the fifth year of the Republic, 1916, Liang Qichao and others in Shanghai held a public memorial ceremony. He also wrote Eurogium of Tsai Songbo at the public memorial ceremony. Meanwhile, he also paid tribute with his relatives at a private ceremony and wrote a separate Eulogium of Tsai Songbo at the private memorial ceremony. It is chronicled as Article 2 in the 15th volume of the collected works of Ying Bing Si. Eulogium of Tsai Songbo at the private memorial ceremony reads The corpse of Tsai Songbo came home from Japan and stopped in Shanghai. It will return to Hunan province for burial. I, Liang Qichao, his teacher, am participating in the memorial service on my travel. I am also accompanied by my brother, Liang Qixun, daughter Liang Sisun, and son Liang Sichen. We respectfully raise clear wine and various food to pay respect to your spirit. We mourn in private with these words. Alas, since the death of my friend Song Bo, wherever there is water well in the country, there are people crying. Why should there be need for my futile words? My friend Song Bo, you should be the one to mourn me, yet now I am mourning you. How can my grief be curbed? You have followed me since the beginning of youth. In haste, it has been 20 years. You were sitting in the corner of the classroom in Changsha asking difficult questions. You were sitting on a mattress 
Laughing and Talking in the Zhou Jianding district of Tokyo. I see these dim shadows whenever I close my eyes. There were not that many days we spent together afterwards. But through letters and spiritual affinity, we shared daily our support and reliance on each other. Between autumn and winter last year, we extinguished the candle across our beds to plot in secret. We brought our separate code words at the parting. Each word and each sentence have been forever engraved in my heart. Three months ago, we had our last intimate conversation in Shanghai. Your weak voice and frail appearance, your rigorous mind and grand spirit, this image is still faintly here. Is it you, Sun Bo? Is it you, Sun Bo? You have unexpectedly abandoned me in the middle of the road. Why have you departed? Alas, during the Boxer Rebellion, your ancestors and your dear friends were exterminated, and you were only a split second away from death. You thus worked diligently to train an army, but you already decided to die for a country that day. You did not die in Guangxi in Yi Si Year, 1905. You did not die in Yunnan in Xinghai Year, 1911. Last winter, you did not die in Hu Guo Temple Street. This spring, you did not die in Qinglong Zui. It was natural for you to view life as just some spare change of existence. Today, you have died for a momentous cause for our nation. Of course, it is an appropriate duty. However, my friend Sun Bo, for you to honor our country, this is your way. As long as you do not come back as a corpse wrapped in fur on a horseback from some forsaken land, I know you cannot close your eyes even in the underworld. Alas, if there is deep regret in your life, I dare not tell others of it. In short, today's society is filled with infinite evil. All quarters want to shove you to your death. What words do I muster to question heaven? O oh, Song Bo, you were born in a time of decline. Indeed, one might as well die in order to return to true nature. Your father has waited in the underworld for 15 years to tell you his hardships. Half of your teachers and friends are already there. They have cast aside their grievances and they will greet you and be close to you. O oh, Song Bo, people of this world, they are not your companions. Have you not also escaped from this emptiness and loneliness to preserve your spirit? We will not burden you with our tribulations. Otherwise, in the underworld, there will still be long sighs and frowns. Alas, I am an inauspicious person in this world. Why have you been so close to me? I count the number of true friends in my life. They have left me one after the other, like fallen leaves of bamboo. There are hardly any left. Not to dwell on the distant past. What about those nearer? Ruo Bo Yuan Yong Jue Dun Dian Yu They were all distinguished men among millions, or wasted midway before reaching forty. Oh, heaven does not wish me to attain any other achievements. Why dispense punishment not on my body, but on that of my student? Not to mention the infinitude of parental kindness and the kinship of brotherly attachment. 
Blood flows when tears desiccate. Souls rejoin in bygone time. My friend Songbo, how can you bear preserving your own purity without me? Alas, I have a brother whom you know well. I have a group of children whose company you enjoy. I lead them here to pay our respect, to requite your spirit, and to remember you forevermore. To hold the incense in my heart, to clasp the wine vessel melted in tears, the mild sunshine, the pretty scenery, the banners imbued with your spirit, fluttering in the wind. In grief, I watch your soul come home. Alas, such woe. I proffer these offerings for your enjoyment. Tsai Songbo passed away in November in the fifth year of the Republic, 1916. Liang Qichao was grief-stricken by the news. On 5th December, a memorial ceremony was held in Shanghai. In the same month, Liang Qichao initiated the preparatory work to establish the Songbo Memorial Library. In November, in the seventh year of the Republic, 1918, the Songbo Memorial Library opened on Bishop's Road in Xuhui District in Shanghai. In the 12th year of the Republic, 1923, the Memorial Library relocated to Kuai Xue Tang in Beihai in Peking. Liang Qichao became the director. On 12th April in the sixth year of the Republic, 1917, Tsai Bo was buried at Yuelu Mountain in Changsha. At that time, Liang Qichao was in Peking and could not travel to Hunan province. He asked his close friend Tang Enpu to ghostwrite eulogium of Tsai Bo at the state funeral. This piece of writing has not been previously publicized. It is a lost artifact of modern history to be treasured. If there were no Liang Qichao and Tsai Songbo, the teacher and student duo who condemned and fought against the enthronement of Yuan Shikai, Yunnan province might not have declared independence and the political inclinations of all the other provinces would be difficult to predict for the deliverance of the democratic system of the Republic of China, contributions made by Liang Qichao and Tsai Songbo were immense. However, calamities are to continuously assault the democratic system of the Republic of China. 21 years later, Japan invaded China. In another 12 years, mainland China fell to the communists. Today, an imperial system in disguise has occupied mainland China for over 70 years. If the spirits of Liang Qichao and Tsai Songbo have not dispersed in the wind, surveying the vast landscape of rivers and mountains, overseeing the billion toiling humans, how can they still savor free and easy wanderings in another world.